you know, so 20 years, I didn't really do that much. And so I found myself at a position where really the question was, what do I do with art? You know, it was always a passion of mine. It was a way that I dealt with my parents being getting a divorce. Uh, it was a way that I found a communication and found a spirit and found peace. So in all of that, I kind of started, um, we ended up in a rental house that um, was owned by a woman who was getting in her 90s and she went to live with her kids and she was an artist, a well-known artist. And there was something about that house, there was something about the spirit of that house that brought me back to art. So there was a little room next to the garage and I set that up as a studio and I went out and you know got all the paint that I had lost in the fire and just started painting and started painting with a with a passion and but you know I'm in my 50s and so for me the idea of what I create now needs to be a little bit more meaningful than maybe it was when I was younger now everything is a series now everything is intended to build into a bigger voice and so I started on this this project that originally started um, on based on the idea of looking at activists that are between the age of like 15 and 23. And, you know, because I really see them as being the future of our generation. I think that they're a whole lot more um, understanding, accepting, empathetic than a lot of people in my generation. And I wanted to try to bring that voice out. Well, the challenge is it's really hard for a 50 some year old guy to connect with young 18 to 20 year olds. There's issues there that are kind of hard to get through. There's also a, a pool that I'm not necessarily tied into. So, um, so I started expanding it to a wider audience than that. And, and with that, honestly, came a lot of wonderful stories, a lot of really interesting faces, deep crags, hairy faces, um, great hair, which I'm a real, um, I love hair. And so, so that's where this all went. And, and the, the thought was, how do I make it with something big and dramatic? So the scale is, is big. And actually, I'm going to, I'm going to jump to something here. Can everyone see this fine? Wait, this iteration of you may not have the host privileges. The oh, other, other two I made sure. So oh, I see. Let okay. me go back. Yeah, there you go. Let me see how I get back here. Oh, there that's you too, go. That's too bad. Um, so, uh, so the work is big. It's four feet by four feet square. It's, it's uh, all monotone. So it's all black and, and, and uh, values of gray. Um, I have to figure out some way to be able to show this work because I think it's key to really telling the story. Is there any way that you can add me into? Yeah, you're, you're, you're a host now. So you have, you have share screen privileges. Okay, so I just had to, it was a one button click. So you should be good to go. So, okay, I think I can do this then. Now that I realized what my problem was, I can go back. So the work started and the work carried over. Um, I guess the body of work is about a two year body of work. And it ended up as a show at uh, the Alley Gallery in February for two months, February and March of last year. And so the first opening was the first of February and everyone was there hugging and kissing each other. The second opening was March 7th, the day before everything shut down. So people were there kind of touching with elbows and then actually it was a week later, the next week, the gallery shut, everything closed down. My name is still on the wall. And so it's kind of like this time capsule is locked. Uh, so let me jump to, uh, here. Let me share the screen. Great. 
All right, can everyone see that fine? Yeah, you're good. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the show in the gallery. So this kind of gives you a context of size and scale and also the, um, the, the, the style of crop on their faces. So it was intended to be modern, you know, in terms of the crops. Um, classic would include the tops of their ones' heads. It would also give a little bit more space around for the most part. Um, so this is, let's see. So this is kind of the view inside the gallery. This is, you can see basically me compared to the size of the pieces. Uh, as one of the, what my daughter's art teacher said, I mean, he's our art teacher from DePaul, he said, it's easy to work large, isn't it? <laughs> you know what the reality is, it is. It's a lot easier to work large than it is to work small. Uh, you have a lot more space to add detail, but I think what it's kind of hard to see in some of these pieces is they're pretty painterly. The brushes tend to be large that I work with. Detail brushes get a little bit smaller, but that brush that I have in my hand is about the smallest brush, that brush that's used. So you'll see that there's a lot of value change. But once you back up, the whole thing reads, you know, pretty cleanly. There's a lot of interest for me in working on the eyes. I think the eyes are they tell a lot of a lot about a person and a personality there's a lot of depth and story that happens in eyes there's also that translucency that translucency of the eye that is just it, you just kind of fall into it i'll go back and kind of give you some stories on each of these people in just a second so their story is as important as their face and i have to say honestly the you know, who they are and what they look like adds to the, the reason that they're chosen. And a lot of these kind of come through a network of people that I know and then others I've just kind of found through doing some research and reached out to them. And, uh, and it's interesting how, how accepting they are to be involved in a lot of this. So I'll start here. This is Niali. This is the this is the woman that this whole thing started with. So she was uh, is a really wonderful, energetic activist who uh, is whose parents are from Haiti. She uh, found herself in a situation in her senior year where her parents needed to go back to Haiti to deal with um, family issues there. So she needed a place to stay. So she lived with us for. I think about four months. And I thought, you know, this is the genesis of it. This is the idea. And Niali um, is an ETH student, ETHS student, sorry. She served on the board of SOAR, which is Students Organized Against Racism. She created multiple initiatives that combated racial discrimination within ETHS and brought to light various issues that have been long overlooked in Evanston's educational history. Her activism continues now in where she goes to school at DePaul and she works to combat Chicago's food desert and affordable housing crisis. She was also most notably known her senior year for um, fighting to shut down Cotillion because it was really a very white driven um, institution and dance and didn't really represent the values of this community. So here we have um, a couple of people, uh, and this is Andy. So this is actually the character right here. He's a great guy. He's a friend of our families, and he is um, um, is an activist because of his life choice. So he is transgender, and and is happy, and is so full of life and so engaged and um, I'm really honored to know this young guy. Um, 
I mean, he has been through so many challenges in his life um, that he's been able to overcome, and he's a shining example of the courage that many of us face if no one has any idea that they're they're struggling, right? I mean, um, so yeah, he's a great guy, wonderful guy. This is Thomas. Now, Thomas is one of the people that I found online. He is an environmental activist, artist, urban planner, civil engineer, historian, truth teller, and member of the Southeast Environmental Task Force. He, had, he lives in um, um, East Chicago uh, in an area where I think five or so years ago, some 120 um, people were told they have to get out of their house because of the lead content in the soil. The US government gave them nothing for their property. Basically um, forced them out in the street and they had to deal with it on their own. He fought for them, he's fought for many things. He, fought, he fights for the quality of the water in, in Lake Michigan and elsewhere and is also just amazing artist. He does encaustics, which is basically you take color and mix it with wax, and then you pour it onto a canvas or a substrate of some kind. And then through a variety of heating processes, you make it flow and blend and separate. It's really a beautiful process. And you know, this guy, that beard alone is enough reason to call him to do a portrait. And he is a wonderful, engaging guy. This is my niece, Leia, who is very much an activist for, um, um, sorry, I'm running through my notes here. She is uh, a big part of If Not Now. So her, fo her work focuses on uniting rather than dividing. It's highlighting a fair and just relationship between Israelis and Palestinians taking a stand for the freedom, dignity, and equality for all. And this is Ife. Ife is uh, she's a Chicago native and a member of the Chicago uh, School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Her work seeks to engage community through racial imag radical imagination, visioning, the activation and facilitation of creative and spiritually expressive learning. She's a founding member of the now inoperative Art Forward and the Healing and Safety Council in uh, BYP 100, which is um, a national organization and the Power Collective. So her early, she has a PhD in, in social and art issues and um, has fought for rights in Chicago and, and black lives for a long, long time and is now educating them. This is Andy again, just a more of a detail shot. Back to Thomas, you get a little bit more detail there than the previous shot. And Sebastian, who is a photographer, um, a visual journalist from Pilsen, who documents the culture of low income black and Latinx communities. Um, as a gentrification transforms those neighborhoods and cultures in Chicago. Um, Sebastian is currently documenting the plight of migrant workers in California and, and still shoots film. So a lot of his stuff is black and white film. The New York Times found his work and did a piece on him in the, in the New York Times Magazine, and, which was all about Pilsen and the gentrification that's happening in Pilsen. But now he gets hired, you know, as a, as a photojournalist and travels all over telling stories of migrant farmers and issues related to race and culture. And then this last guy is Nestor. Now Nestor is a storyteller, a professional storyteller, and has been doing this for I think the last three to five years. Before that, he, you know, told family stories, but then people said, you know, your stories are so good, you should do these publicly. So now he has an organization, uh, or a team, I should say. So he's the creator and producer and curator of 80 Minutes Around the World, in which he and his guests share the realities and experiences immigrants, refugees, and their descendants and allies face living and working in the United States. 
<clears throat> now with all of these pieces, uh, there's an intent too with a little bit of a deeper meaning. So with him, the idea of, you know, putting his hand over his mouth, questions whether he uh, is welcome to tell his story and if, whether it's a story that we really want to hear. Um, with some of the others, Ife has that kind of half turned away profile, which is also, again, like she's looking back over her shoulder to see who's coming behind her. So there's a lot of things like that. The process that I have is I spend 30 minutes with the people. It's, it's basically put on hold now with COVID, but I would spend 30 minutes with the people photographing them, sitting them in a chair and just start a conversation. And you know, the first 20 minutes of photography is basically thrown away because they know they're being photographed. But after that, it becomes a conversation and I'm able to get deeper into who they are visually from a personality. And, and they're, you know, all of their barriers kind of let go and they open up and um, I'm able to communicate visually on a deeper level. So I am gonna stop sharing. Oh, and then, um, sorry, I missed this one. Share who is a writer and journalist. She's a native of Pakistan who splits her time between Peshawar and New York, where she goes to where she actually just finished her um, doctoral um, education. She is now back in Peshawar because um, if she leaves the government, if she leaves the country for education, she has to come back for two years. She, in, that, in that time in between, she got married to a Pakistani national who lives in Arizona. So now she goes back to Pakistan and lives with her husband's family because that's, that's accepted in the culture. So, so, you know, it's a lot of this stuff is an understanding once you get to meet these people of exactly how different their cultures are from ours and how much we need to learn and understand from these other cultures, especially now in politics. Well, you would think that there's only one culture that we have to take care of and, and pay any attention to, which is, you know, so far from the truth. Okay, I'm gonna jump back. And if you have any questions, I would love to fill you in. Am I back now? Okay, yeah, so thanks so much. Uh, that, that was great. And I'm glad we were able to figure out some of the screen share for the folks who weren't able to drop by the church and, and see. It was one thing that was really cool was seeing uh, the sanctuary basically turned into uh, an impromptu art gallery, which was pretty fun. Uh, it was a really unique experience that I hope we get to have uh, more of, honestly. But um, let's, uh, I've got some questions, but I, I think it's always a little better when we hear from everybody else about what's on their mind before you hear from me. So if you wanna ask a question, you should be able to unmute, if not, let me um, let me mute all and then allow. So the first step is actually to mute everybody, but that allows everyone to unmute. So just unmute and ask your question. Uh, from Chris Neal, I was curious. I know one of the portraits was your niece, but I would be interested in knowing how you met the other people. So let's see, Andy which is the young man I talked about. He is, um, I grew up with him essentially. So he's, he's a neighbor kid and um, I've known him for 20, 26 years, I guess. So I saw him through his whole life and while he's gone through, uh, there's one other person here who I didn't talk about who was a professor at Northwestern. I found him through Andy and he, he works, uh, is very big in the LGBTQ community and just started a, um, a um, television uh, production called, uh, uh, oh my God, I'm sorry, uh, but it's all about, I'm drawing a blank on it, but it's all about issues that surround that community and about bringing attention and awareness to that community. Cher, I found through uh, my brother and sister, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law. She had come to Evanston on an exchange and stayed with them. So I got to know her um, deeply from, you know, her upbringing in her past, but then also got to 
know her from her you know association of living in the United States um, and then some of the other people you know kind of came through a network I did some research to find people who were specific within an area that I was looking for uh, so it was you know I would say 90% of them came from a network of people that I know and am friendly with and then a small percentage came from research Thank you. Sure. I do want to comment that I had seen your website prior to this talk and I, your approach to the thought that went into the angles and how that person is portrayed is really very unique and different as far as portraiture goes and it's really wonderful. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, Chris, oh, this is Don. Uh, 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 beautiful work. I wish I had seen it uh, in, in in church. I, I want, would love to see it. I love your, the detail that you have and the expressions uh, that you, you you capture. It's just uh, it's a gift. Uh, what maybe refer to? Why is the top of the head uh, cut off? It, it, well, it's different on all of them. Uh, right. But it's, you know, it's a modern approach to, to, to portraiture, I would say. Okay. It's more, you know, I mean, look, we live within these communities now. <laughs> 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 the way we see each other is different than the way we would have. Exactly. Not been tied to screens in some way. So that's part of it. Okay. What, what, what's your next topic and how are you going to pick the next people? Well, um, so this this project is on hold for a little bit, but during at the beginning of COVID, I started a very small kind of a project where I would get somebody to donate two hundred dollars to a small business owner, and then I would go and photograph that small business owner. At least that's how it first started at the very beginning of COVID, and then it later became. Um, I would try to art direct them and then send, they would send me photos. So I did um, about 15 portraits and collected about $3,000 for small business. And, but those are all very small, you know, nine by nine by 12 uh, and are all color. So um, unfortunately, I don't have any of those here because they all left, but I can give you an idea. They roughly, are this kind of thing, are, are really much more of a classic portrait. And um, then, then these big black and whites that I do, but it was really, there were, it was kind of twofold. It was a, a way, first of all, to get me to kind of deal with this shutting down um, with COVID, but also an opportunity to give back to, I'm a small business owner and, you know, initially I was very concerned by what that meant for my business and my family and and everything and thought if I could give back a little bit, it would be awesome. So, and it was fun. It was really fun. So that's, and then right now. Joe's. Chris, can you see that? Oh yeah. There's the guy from Prairie Joe's. <laughs> <laughs> We're a tag team, my wife. Yeah. <laughs> I know Prairie Joe's very well. <laughs> yeah. And he was just, I mean, he was wonderful to work with and he, and in his style with everything, he took the portrait and then <laughs> put it up in, his, in the restaurant and then like put post-it note signs on it. And then... <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll post the link that, that, that you can visit to see some more of those on, on the, yeah. the, uh, mm -hmm. the interview that you gave and on, and that sort of. Yeah, yeah. On channel 11. So yeah. If you want to take a look at some more of that. So that's good stuff. like to say um, Chris um, I saw your pictures in the in the uh, bookstore is it the bookstore not it's the gallery right yeah. In, yeah. In the, yeah I did see them so, so um, I, I think it's truly person-centered and I, I think that I can see how fascinating that that project is to get to know the, the, the person uh, the 
the project they are working on, their personalities. Uh, I can see how, how that um, really inspires you. Um, I was also, I was intrigued by your story where you say, you know, you, you, you did art in high school and then you took a long break and then you came back to it later on. And um, this is, <laughs> I'm exactly in that same situation. And uh, I watched my children and especially my daughter do her art and I was always jealous. I felt I didn't have the time to do it. And now I basically, I do feel I have the time or I have to make the time. But the question, you know, um, I have a lot of ideas, but where do you, how do you actually dig in? How did you come to say, okay, this is what I want to do and then actually carry it through? Because I think um, just starting something and then actually diving in and, and developing it, I think that's a challenge in itself. Unless you just were inflamed and you could just go ahead. I'm a guy who loves a project. Uh -huh. uh, so that's part of it. I have that kind of uh, energy to put behind something, but like, like anything, you know, it started with this portrait of Niali and was really intended to go in one direction. And then at mm -hmm. some point took a completely left turn but still, the, the, the foundation of the whole thing was exactly the same. It was just opening up to a wider audience. And, mm -hmm. and I think you, know, you look at somebody's face like Thomas, there's just so much there. There's so, so much of a story of what he's been through that I can't begin to, yeah. to clearly tell. But mm -hmm. there's, there, you know, everybody reads something different into Thomas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, also, I, I, I like what you said. Now that I'm older, <laughs> I like to do something more meaningful, you know. Yeah. And then where I am, I, I'm, you can do a lot of pretty pictures. <laughs> That's what I have been doing. But uh, just to do something that actually um, is in, in line with maybe your other interests and, and, and convey something. I, I think yeah. I'm really impressed that you, that you managed to do that. It's really well, great. I mean, and that's also where the series aspect becomes really beneficial because yeah, it all together is a much larger thing than one. So yeah, that's something that I learned in art school, but didn't really, you know, pay attention to it until now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and each part of the series is huge. <laughs> it's so huge. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, not I'm not just talking of the size of the portrait. Oh. I'm talking oh. just. <laughs> The whole person. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thanks. Purpose in doing this particular project. I mean, did you want to get to know these kind of people more? Did you want to publicize it, or is there are there other things that caused you to take this as the series you did? You know, a part of it was um, so from the time I was a little kid, all I wanted to do was paint faces. I wanted to be a portrait artist. I've always loved that and always felt this affinity to, to that. But so uh, absolutely one of the things I was very interested in from the very beginning was to get a large enough body of work together that I could have a show, that I could show these. So that was really the push behind all of it. But I'll have to say the, the coolest thing that came out of this was the fact that I got to meet all these people and got all these different perspectives and all this different energy from all these people who are so interesting and so cool and are doing so much for us, you know, the bigger, bigger um, society that, you know, it, a lot can change with just one person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you don't think it can, a lot can change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a question, Chris. Hey. I, well, two things. Who got me a lot of my portrait people. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Chris's brother-in-law. And so I, one of the things I was going to say is that I had the good fortune to watch you photograph Cher, who was the young Pakistani woman who was our exchange student when she was here in high school. And that watching you interact with her in that situation was so great. I mean, just because you were, I mean, you were interacting with her and she was taking it very seriously. She was really into it, but the conversation and the posing and the lighting, I, I only watched a minute or two of it, but that was, that, that's, 
to me, a very cool part of this is you've got to come up with an image, a photograph that you want to paint. Right. The thing I, the question I have is, I remember that early on there were portraits that you did and then like redid the, this whole giant portrait or made a lot of changes to it. Can you say, talk about what you, kind of what you learned along the way of, that made you want to change, you know, go back and redo some things? Some of it was just, some of it was just work I wasn't happy with. You know, you get it to a certain point and you get so deep into it, you kind of feel like it's not just a matter of changing a few things to fix it. It's about starting all over. <laughs> so that's part of it. Also with the portrait of Leia, uh, I, so I mix a special black and I mixed a bad special black to begin with. And hers was cooler than everybody else's. So when you held it together in the whole body, it was, it was a blue black, it wasn't a warm black. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I'm just gonna change a few things and that'll fix it. And <laughs> it was a complete reconstruct. But I gotta tell you, it's so much better the second time than it was the first time. So it's like, you know, anytime you do something a, a second time or almost every time you do something a second time, it's better. So that's part of that. Luckily, there weren't too many of those. Otherwise, I'd still be here waiting. Chris, you're attracted to different social causes. What, 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 what's next? What, what are, what are things that you, you want to um, describe or, or find people that uh, exemplify a, a certain type of of social justice movement. Um, or, or do you just meet people and find their story and say, I want to, I want to, I want to paint you? Well, so I've just started on this. So I actually hired a model. Uh, she works at the Art Institute. She does live modeling for um, students there. Uh, but so hired her, took her to the beach up in Highland Park and did a whole series of photos of like individual and landscape. And so the next series I'm starting now is this idea of a figure. And it's the degree to which that figure is, is clearly defined is not yet defined in my mind. But it's just the idea of what happens when you put a figure in a landscape and you use those same techniques of positioning a body, turning a body, the way they look, who what they're looking at, how many of those figures are in that same landscape. What kind of story can you tell with that? I also love this idea of water. Uh, I've been a sailor my whole life and you know, living in Evanston, especially, you know, the water is a big part of who we are here. Um, that, and there's, there is peace in water. There is fear in water. There are so many things that mm -hmm. water and that like that quiet, um, um, horizon that leads from water to sky and the idea that none of that ever really ends, but it all just continues right around us. So that's the next thing I'm beginning to work on. So that should be interesting. Mm -hmm. I like 10 years of painting out of one hour of photography. <laughs> Great, worth the investment. Mm -hmm. Chris, I have a couple of questions. I'm not sure if I'm going to ask them very well or if they're very answerable. But the first is um, you, you mentioned the eyes and how important the eyes are. I guess, and, and a lot of these portraits, and I'm looking at your website of the portraits, and these are not only uh, the eyes are very expressive, but these are very striking faces as well. Um, so what's come, what, what is the expression? When you see somebody's face in your photographs that you take, and you decide that's what you want to paint. What, what, where is the expression start from? Does it, is the, uh, does it start from the eyes and then the eyes frame the face or does the frame, the face frame the eyes? Where, how, how does that happen? Because these are, like I said, not only the eyes are very powerful, but these are very striking faces. Um, I was just curious point. as to. And you know what, I think with each one of these people, it's slightly different. Like in Ife, the lips of Ife um, are 
are so powerful and so strong. And it's that idea of a voice with her. And then also just that mane of hair. She's just such a queen. She's so strong and you kind of get a sense of that from her. But, you know, when I look at what I have here on the screen, each, each of them is different. But I, I have to say, ultimately, it, it seems like it always comes down to the eyes and the ear. And that's, mm -hmm. that's where we always connect with people, I think, the most. And the other question, and I'm not sure how this could be answered, but is, are these portraits a reflection of what you think they are expressing, expressing with their presentation, or is it uh, a, an interpretation from your perspective of who they are? It's, it's, uh, it is a little bit of both. Yeah, I mean, uh, I would like to think that it's an interpretation and that I'm nailing the interpretation. Uh, but I think a lot of it is just, a, you know, a number of moving parts that all have to kind of play together in some way. You know, it's two eyes and nose and mouth and ears and all, each one of those things has its own personality and identity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk just a little bit because the thing that's kind of easy to skip over in some of your narrative is that sort of experience of trauma, like your, your house burned down, right? I mean, that, oh. that you kind of skip over that in like one, one phrase and then, you know, obviously you're in this rental place and there's something special about that. But I wonder, you know, I uh, just thinking about art and the connection between passion and creativity and making meaning out of that experience. What, what do you have any more sort of reflections of, about emerging out of that sort of place of trauma? Uh, why that was such a productive space for you? Well, and um, I think it's just that it's emerging out of the trauma. You know, I wasn't home for the fire. I was in New York on business and my family dealt with it. So I kind of, I came back to the aftermath of it. I came mm -hmm. back to the stories that everybody told me. And I saw my kids with PTSD um, in really, in strange ways that none of us could understand. Um, but I think to this day, all of my kids um, carry something that is really monumental because of it. So, so because of that, we have to find these things in, that heal us and make us feel better. And um, it's my religion, you know, it's, it's, my, it's where I find my spirituality. And it's where I feel the closest to the better part of who we all are. So... It's always been that way for me. I mean, it was because my parents got a divorce, I immediately turned to art to communicate and get myself through it. And then after the fire, I come back to it again. And, you know, mm. it, I, out of adversity comes so many powerful things that mm. people who haven't experienced it uh, could never know. Mm. Yeah, it's not, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I, you don't probably don't have to, uh, under, undergo directly some of the sort of things that you're talking about. Your parents getting divorced, yeah. your house burning down, that sort of trauma. But it certainly seems like so many people who are creative, who bring an interesting approach to something, are working through some of that trauma and from that place and, and making meaning in that way. It just seems like a, whether that's a therapeutic or that's working through it, or it's just that uh, whenever we experience trauma, we're more open to that side of ourselves. I mean, I, as a sort of a meaning making and maybe even a survival strategy in some ways. I just find that really interesting yeah. how that's part of your story and how that's part of so many other people that I hear story. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think to me, like you returning to old passion, I mean, it's not so, so divorced from, from what you do, do for work, right? I mean, um, it's, exactly. it's, not, it's, not, it's not at all divorced, but you know, in the sense that the, the fine art aspect of this uh, and the portraiture that you're talking about, that you're doing sort of now, um, that sort of return, it's almost, almost like we can access our passions or more clearly discern what our passions are or how to make meaning when other parts of our life are sort of forced to be uh, the brakes are forced on on them in some way so yeah and really i mean what what i do i'm creating images every day in, in my in my life but that's always for somebody else you know the final outcome in some way is directed by somebody other than me and i do it for them here i have full control of starting and stopping and communicating with other people. so it's this is like 
you know, this is the clean air that I get to breathe um, in the garden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's, uh, and it's, it's, you're determining it, but also so much of what you do is community based. This is this community of people who are working on, uh, who have their own sort of a community of activists. The activists have their own sort of communities that they're working with. Uh, when you're talking about the sort of uh, small business owners there in COVID-19, I mean, that's, that's a real community, art is community outreach as, as right. all that sort of stuff. So it's, um, it, it is, you determine the outcome, but at the same time, it's so, it's, it'd be a mistake, I think, to read that as an individualistic sort of um, turn and it's a turn towards community. So it's interesting too. Mm -hmm. Chris, are there any public figures that you'd like to do a portrait of? In Obama, um, yeah, there's, yeah, there's so many. The, the only thing is about once you do a public figure like that, it's less. Yeah, it feels different to me. You know, it's um, they're already so well known. Everybody already has chosen what they think of those people. It's where these people who people don't know is the opportunity to really kind of bring that to life. So while I, you know, I would just love to hang out in a room with Obama, not necessarily paint his portrait, but uh, there's just more stress that comes with that. And actually I have a client who we do some work with Walsh Corporation and, and the senior executives there. He said, how about if I have you do portraits of all these guys? And I thought, that's awesome. And then I thought, why would I want to do that? You know, I mean, it's like at some point that becomes something completely different. And also the stress around that is more than I want to deal with. You know, these high powered bald guys coming at me, that doesn't look like me. <laughs> you, you could yeah. paint in hair, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so I don't know. It's an interesting thing too. Portraits. You know, I think when you do a portrait of the person, it comes with so much, right? The, you know, for the person that you do it for, it's like, is that me? And then there's the idea of the vanity of somebody painted my portrait, and it's hanging in my house. But then when you think about like that person's children or grandchildren or great grandchildren, now the value just becomes exponentially greater that, wow, oh, look at this portrait of my grand, my great grandmother from, you know, 19 or 2010. Oh my God, that's so long ago, you know? That's where the value becomes and the richness becomes something that is, you just can't put it, and it's not even about price, it's about emotion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's something really interesting about portrait work. What was the feedback you got from your, um clients <laughs> well good i think you know i mean uh i think uh you know i i know uh, i know a couple of them there were there they're like wow it's it's really strange to have um, my head four feet by four feet on the wall you know it's like it's kind of bigger than them but then again in that way it is bigger than them it's almost not them in some way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's an interpretation you know, and that's the interesting thing. So the photograph I take is an interpretation of them, but then the painting of the photograph is another interpretation. So in some ways you get a couple steps away from the real individual. Yeah, yeah. Did they recognize themselves? They did, I'm happy to say. <laughs> Actually, Ife said to me, where are those earrings? I lost those earrings. I love those earrings. And they're really <laughs> kind of chevron earrings. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah. You know, Chris. Oh, sorry. oh man. Te oh, sorry. Is so, bound. Um, so what you just said about portraiture and its meaning down through the generations totally struck me in a way that it never had before. Mm -hmm. So when I was growing up, there was a portrait of my mother, big size portrait of my mother in our living room. I of her that. from when she was a teenager. She had the portrait done when she was like 16 and it was like featured in our, my childhood living room. And I always thought that was almost a little strange, like this right. picture of my mother, like on the wall. I mean, I lived with my mother, right? 
But now it hangs, I mean, my mother, my mother, as you know, passed away. And now it hangs on our wall in our stairwell. And it's so sweet to see my mother as a young girl on the That's wall. Awesome. And Thank you. For, the, for my children, you know, Leah and right. Anna too. And so I, it and never really too. struck me until you just said that about the value, you know, for the next generation. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I don't know how I feel about portrait of my It's very cool. I mean, like, but I don't know. Yeah, it's it's just the sort of removal from the person itself in that sense, just because it's it's uh, your mom, but it's bef it's before before you knew your mom. You know, like I mean, and it's there's there's it's, it is that person, but it's also some some degree of separation from that identity too that makes it a really interesting and revealing thing. I think about art in general. All right, we got we got time for one more. If you if you if you got if you got a question, this is great. And so we we recorded this, and so this will be posted on the website also on so passionprojectlsc.com, and uh, so it'll, it'll be there and it'll it'll be on the Facebook page. We'll send you the link too, of course, Chris. So, and but uh, if if you got one last question, now's the time. I have a question. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh, so um, my son has great hair. So how would I get you to paint him <laughs> while he still has it and everything? You know what? Send me an email. Okay. Yeah, I'll give you my email. Well, I mean, this is the this is this is the hair expert, though. <laughs> there's, there's like there's like mother love where you think that the hair may be great but maybe it's not top notch we don't know <laughs> that's my two yeah uh, chris this was a wonderful experience i'm so glad to have tuned in i'm just an, it's an honor to see your work and and, and hear you talk about it well, it's an honor for me to be here yeah 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 thank you thank you so much for sharing um just some of this, uh, just the, the conversation about passion and creativity, how we make meaning in the world and how do we work, where, where do we work through trauma and stuff like that, I think it is really important. And I just think you added so much to our understanding of it. And good, just keep up the awesome work in Evanston. Yeah. I mean, I think just the Please. fact that it's such a local effort means so much to me uh, and how we're, you know, we're rooted in, in, in that too. I mean, how I think about, um, I think most people want to make impact locally. Um, and I think that you yeah. really succeed in doing that. So uh, that's a, it's been really great to have that conversation. So great. thank you. Thank you also everybody else for coming. Thanks, yeah, thanks and so to all the people who watch this later, but who came to the church to see it. Thank you too. Great job, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. See ya. Bye.